Bom dia a todos, bom dia a todas. É um prazer estar aqui com vocês para dar início ao 12º Workshop Empresa, Empresários e Sociedade. Eu estou aqui com a comissão organizadora do evento, os professores Elaine da Silva Leite, da Silveira Leite, da Universidade Federal de Pelotas, o professor Paulo Roberto Neves Costa, da Universidade Federal do Paraná, e também fazem parte da comissão organizadora a professora Janina Onuki, aqui da USP, e o professor Maurício Reinert, do Nascimento, da Universidade Estadual do Maringá. É um prazer estar aqui nesse momento com eles. Eu queria começar, antes da palestra do professor Jonathan Mendel, explicando um pouco o que é o workshop Empresa, Empresários e Sociedade. Esse workshop é um evento que, está, que se realiza a cada dois anos, desde 1988. E é, até onde nós sabemos, o único evento assim, duradouro, de longo prazo, que se dedica totalmente a promover pesquisa e a compartilhar pesquisa sobre o universo empresarial no Brasil e no mundo, a partir de uma perspectiva multidisciplinar. Ou seja, nesse nosso evento se reúnem pesquisadores das mais diversas áreas das ciências humanas, das ciências sociais e das ciências sociais aplicadas. Ciência política, sociologia, antropologia economia, administração, história, relações internacionais, entre outras. Então, é um workshop totalmente dedicado ao estudo sobre o empresariado, nas mais diversas perspectivas disciplinares, também com, é, as, aberto para as mais diversas abordagens teóricas e metodológicas para o estudo do empresariado. É, esse, a programação desse evento a nosso ver, da comissão organizadora, está muito boa. Serão duas palestras, daqui a alguns minutos, o professor Jonathan Mendelow é, vai, vai dar a palestra de abertura, e no final do evento, na sexta-feira, o professor Armando Boito vai fazer a palestra de encerramento. Então, serão duas palestras, a palestra de abertura, hoje às 10h15, e a palestra de encerramento... No, no dia 18, né, é, sexta-feira, às 15 horas, com o professor Armando. E é, esse evento, ele terá, é, ele é dividido em quatro eixos. Hoje à tarde, será a apresentação dos dois primeiros eixos. O eixo 1, um, que é coordenado pelo, pelos professores Daniel Mocelin da Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, e Lucas Azambuja, do IBMEC de Belo Horizonte, e o eixo 1 um é Inovação Empresarial, Tecnologia e Desenvolvimento Econômico. E também hoje à tarde serão apresentados os trabalhos do eixo 4, que, que é coordenado pelos professores Mauro Roese, da, também da Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, e Lúcia Helena Alves Miller, da PUC do Rio Grande do Sul. O eixo 4 se chama Universo Empresarial, Cultura, Valores e Identidade. Então, a apresentação dos trabalhos dos eixos 1 e 4 começará hoje, às 2 horas da tarde. Amanhã, a partir das 9 horas da manhã, e aí o dia inteiro, será dedicado ao eixo 2, coordenado pelos professores Paulo Roberto Neves Costa, da Universidade Federal do Paraná, e Eduardo Rodrigues Gomes, da Universidade Federal Fluminense. Esse eixo 2 se chama Empresariado, Política e Democracia. Então, a apresentação dos trabalhos começará às 9 horas, até às 13, vai ter uma pausa para o almoço, e depois às 2 nós retomamos até às 6 e, por fim, no dia 18, pela manhã, a partir das 9 horas, haverá a apresentação dos trabalhos do Eixo 3, que é coordenado pelas professoras Elaine da Silveira Leite, da Universidade Federal de Pelotas, e Marina de Souza Sartori, da Universidade Federal de Sergipe. O Eixo 3 se chama Sociologia da Ação Empresarial, 
empresas, sociedade e mercado. Então serão ao todo 32 apresentações de trabalho divididas nesses quatro eixos. Então nós teremos uma diversidade temática bem grande, uma diversidade disciplinar bem grande, teremos sociólogos, cientistas políticos, eh, antropólogos, pessoas das mais diversas áreas eh, do conhecimento das ciências humanas e sociais, e também uma grande diversidade institucional. Teremos pessoas do Sudeste, do Nordeste, do Norte, do Centro-Oeste e do Sul, né, apresentando seus trabalhos. E, no, no dia, na sexta-feira, às duas horas da tarde, nós também teremos uma sessão de homenagens, que é uma tradição nossa. Um, é, a gente homenageará dois pioneiros é, do, do estudo sobre o empresariado no Brasil, os professores Eduardo Rodrigues Gomes e Maria Antonieta Leopoldi, ambos da Universidade Federal Fluminense, lá no Rio de Janeiro. Então, é, é um prazer enorme é, estar aqui é, com vocês, com uma programação tão diversa. É, espero que, que todos aproveitem bem é, e possam estar conosco ao longo desses, desses dias. Eu queria agora é, compartilhar a palavra com alguns colegas aqui que, que me ajudaram, que colaboraram, contribuíram, né, trabalharam comigo e com o pessoal do Instituto de Estudos Avançados da USP para organizar esse evento. Os professores Elaine da Silveira Leite, da Universidade Federal de Pelotas, é, Paulo Roberto Neves Costa, da Universidade Federal do Paraná, Janino Nuque, da USP, e Maurício Reinert, do nascimento da Universidade Estadual do Maringá. Mas antes de passar a palavra para os meus colegas, eu gostaria de fazer um enorme agradecimento à equipe do IEA, do Instituto de Estudos Avançados. É, a, o trabalho, é, a ajuda da, da Cláudia foi muito importante né, para para organizar todo esse evento da Cláudia Regina. Então, muito obrigado, Cláudia, por toda a sua ajuda ao longo desse período de preparação do evento. Muito obrigado também ao Sérgio Ricardo, que está aqui é, auxiliando é, na parte técnica. Então, é, já passo a palavra então, primeiro para a professora Elaine da Silveira Leite e depois para o professor Paulo. Muito obrigado, gente. Vamos começar um bom evento agora. Obrigada, Wagner. Um bom dia a todas e todos. É uma honra poder integrar a comissão organizadora do 12º Workshop Empresa Empresariado e Sociedade né? e participar dessa comissão com os colegas aqui presentes, o Wagner, o Paulo, o Maurício, a Janina né? e os demais também que fazem parte da comissão ah, científica. Né? Hoje, iniciando o 12º evento, ah, né, pensando são 24 anos dessa dessa rede, né, oficialmente, digamos assim, né, formando aí gerações de pesquisadores, né, que participam e integram constantemente dessa rede aí, e pesquisadores de todas as regiões do país, das mais diversas ah, instituições de pesquisa, né. Então, muito bom poder participar, muito bom, né, poder estar aqui integrando ah, nesse evento a comissão organizadora, né? Eu acho que é interessante também como a, essa rede se renova, né? Constantemente vem fortalecendo as pesquisas sobre um tema que é muito importante, né? O estudo do empresariado brasileiro que envolve, né? A dimensão política, a dimensão sociológica, enfim, né? A, nos tempos em que vivemos, né? E são estudos que envolvem diferentes perspectivas teóricas, metodológicas e científicas, né? Então, acho que eu só posso né, dar parabéns, dar parabéns para todos os envolvidos, né? e acho que hoje, em especial, agradecer ao Instituto de Estudos Avançados e à USP por nos receber aqui, mesmo que virtualmente, né? em especial a Janina e o Wagner, né, que representantes ali da USP, de certa forma, encararam, né, tomaram a frente dessa comissão a organizadora. Né? Então, na verdade, vou ser breve, né, quero desejar né, sejam todos bem-vindos ao 12º Workshop Empresa Empresariado e Sociedade. Né? Desejo a todos, então, 
um ótimo evento. Wagner, eu vou passar a palavra, acho que para o Paulo, pode ser? Perfeito. Obrigada a todos, um bom evento. Bom dia, só aguardando a Helene. Bom, é um prazer estar aqui novamente em mais uma edição desse evento, que já tem mais do que a, a, o período da sua existência, todos os desdobramentos de publicações, de, de artigos, livros que, que foram é, derivados desses encontros, o que reforça a, a, a importância do que a Elaine disse, ou seja, de uma dimensão geracional de, de colegas que estavam apresentando seus trabalhos, as primeiras edições desse evento e que agora estão organizando este evento e espero que isso ocorra também em relação ao futuro, ou seja, que esse evento traga a participação de novos pesquisadores, novas pesquisadoras, não só na produção dos seus trabalhos, mas também na manutenção dessas redes que são muito importantes para a, a divulgação dos nossos trabalhos, mas principalmente para a própria qualidade dos nossos trabalhos, dada essa dimensão do contato com outras pesquisas, inclusive de outras perspectivas, como o Wagner apontou. E que mesmo nessa condição da pandemia, talvez até em função da condição da pandemia, a gente talvez consiga até atingir um público maior, é, o que reforça essa, essa natureza do, do evento de, e essa, essa intenção de manter essa agenda de pesquisa viva e ativa e trazendo certamente contribuições importantes para tentar compreender o momento que a gente vive agora, de várias perspectivas, e inclusive dando um retorno à sociedade em relação a, ao nosso trabalho e as nossas contribuições para compreender tudo o que está acontecendo. Então, saúdo a todos e todas presentes que vão participar desse evento, todos os colegas que vão apresentar trabalho, a, a todos que estiverem envolvidos na organização acadêmica e científica, e também a todo o corpo de técnicos que estão ajudando na produção do evento, porque a gente sabe como, como esse trabalho é importante, é decisivo para o sucesso do evento, desde a divulgação do processo de inscrição até a realização do, próximo, do próprio evento. Então, eu saúdo a todos e todas e agradeço e desejo um bom evento para todos nós. Obrigado. Então, agora nós passamos a palavra para o professor Maurício Heinen, da Universidade Estadual do, do Maringá. É, dá boas-vindas a, a todos, né, a todas. Agradecer inicialmente ao Wagner e eu só gostaria de ressaltar dois aspectos que eu acho que são fundamentais, né? Uh, talvez três aspectos fundamentais do, do, do evento. Um é, o Wagner já ressaltou, é a diversidade né, de trazer pessoas uh, de, de, não só uh, uh, do Brasil inteiro, mas de diferentes áreas né, para discutir um objeto, um mesmo objeto. Né? E isso é muito importante uh, uh, para a construção uh, de, do conhecimento sobre a empresas e empresários uh, e a sociedade no Brasil. O segundo aspecto é a característica que o evento tem de uh, ter sempre uma sala só de apresentação, ou seja, faz com que essa diversidade seja verdadeira, né? porque muitas vezes a gente vai participa de eventos que são diversos, mas que cada grupo se reúne separadamente no seu habitat. Né? E aqui a gente coloca todo mundo junto para discutir. E, por fim, né? a questão de ser um evento aberto a todos né? e incentivar principalmente a participação dos estudantes, dos é, pesquisadores iniciantes, né? Ah, por ser um evento que é, sempre manteve a tradição de ser gratuito. Né? E agora, na pandemia, trazendo isso, né? a, ampliando a participação das pessoas. Então, a ressaltar a importância disso e de que a gente possa continuar com esse evento. Né? Eu tenho participado aqui desde 2007, para mim foi a, 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 muito importante na minha carreira acadêmica participar a, desse... Do, do, do workshop, né? em, em termos de crescimento, de, de, de possibilidade de, de, de conhecer né? ah, pessoas e conhecer diferentes áreas de pesquisa. Né? Então, ah, eu acho que a manutenção do evento né? e o fortalecimento do evento está muito nesse trabalho que, é, novamente, vou agradecer ao Wagner né? e ao, ao Instituto e à USP, né? ah, porque eu sei como é difícil né? a gente é, organizou lá na, na Universidade Estadual de Maringá, Uh, e é essa, esse empenho né, e essa, essa doação que a gente está fazendo né, no nosso meio acadêmico também possibilita o fortalecimento da nossa relação com a sociedade. Então, agradecer ao Wagner, à USP, né, por estar nos recebendo aqui. Obrigado, Wagner. 
Bom, eu que agradeço, então, é, as palavras do, dos professores da comissão organizadora, a professora Elaine, o professor Paulo, o professor Maurício. A professora Janina avisou que não poderia estar é, presente hoje por causa de um outro evento que ela está participando, é, mas eu queria agradecer ao, ao empenho da professora Janina, que é, disponibilizou desde o primeiro minuto o Instituto de Relações Internacionais para ajudar a, a conduzir e organizar o evento. É, infelizmente, é, a pandemia nos impossibilitou de fazer esse evento presencialmente, mas é, nós estamos fazendo aqui virtualmente. É, agora eu vou pedir licença para a gente mudar a, o idioma, porque eu vou fazer a apresentação do palestrante de hoje, que vai dar a palestra de abertura, o professor é, Jonathan Mendel. Professor Jonathan? É. Jonathan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm here. I will change the language to English in order to introduce you to Professor Jonathan Mangelo. First, I would like to express our profound gratitude to Professor Jonathan Mangelo, uh, who accepted the invitation to give this opening lecture for our workshop, Business, Business People and Society. Professor Jonathan Mangelo is a professor of the Department of Political Science at Ryder University in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. He is the chair of the Research Committee on Political Finance and Political Corruption of the International Political Science Association. Professor Jonathan Mangelo published several articles chapters and books on the subject of his talk this morning, from which I would like to highlight the two more recent books, both from Edgar, Edward Elgar Publishing. First, the Handbook of Political Party Funding, published in 2018, three years ago, and second, Populism and Corruption, The Other Side of the Coin, which is going to be published next Friday. Uh, the title of his talk this morning is going to be Political Finance and Political Corruption, a Political Science Perspective, but I, I, I know that he is going to, uh, to make some adaptations to this uh, title. Uh, after the talk, He will be available to answer some questions coming from the audience. And people from the audience can uh, write the, the questions and send the questions to this email, uh, earesponde.usp.br. I think the email is uh, being showing uh, right now. And Uh, you can send the questions in either in Portuguese or in English. If you send the questions in Portuguese, I will try to summarize them and translate them to Professor uh, Jonathan. So let's now hear the opening lecture from, from our guest speaker, Professor Jonathan Mangelo. Professor Jonathan Mangelo, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Wagner. And let me start by uh, saying hello to an old friend, Paolo. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet you again, if only by Zoom. Uh, and uh, we had a wonderful time in Curitiba with uh, Paolo being our instructor. And uh, it is a pleasure to return the favor. Let me uh, try to define what I'm going to do here. Uh, first, uh, you'll forgive me for not presenting any uh, footnotes or uh, bullet points and speaking rather fast in English. Uh, 
this is my style of teaching and I simply uh, would like to continue it. I feel free with it. Please stop me, ask through Wagner any questions or simply intervene and stop me ask to ask me to repeat or to do anything that you would like me to do. My uh, discussion today will be really more theoretical than concrete. And this indeed, here lies the difference between an academic study and a journalistic study. And in fact, the subject that we're dealing with was dealt mainly by journalists. It's a question of scandals. It's a question of uh, things that crop up to the uh, newspapers, to the media, and the term uh, alternative reality, I think, has been seeped also in Brazil. The question is, what is true? What is not true? What really happened? What is not happened? What is a scandal? What is a scandal that it is a scandal? I would like simply to avoid and to leave to any questions um, with a particular different distance from uh, Brazil, simply because uh, in the face of Wagner and Paulo, I am very little of an expert in Brazilian affairs. So I would like to tie a connection here as a kind of a triangle between three different concepts. One of them is political populism, the other political corruption, and the third, a particular mode of corruption that we refer to as clientelism. The uh, connection between those three has been popularized during the last several years uh, to no extent. And the problem is that we don't exactly know what the concept mean and what indeed is the connection between them. So let me start by pointing out to the definitions that I will be using here, the way I understand what the subject is. First, corruption. This is a concept that up to now did not meet clear definition. The reason is twofold. One, uh, time changes and places change, and the consequence of that is that there is an inherent instability of the concept. What has been considered a hundred years ago, corruption is no longer corruption and vice versa. So it is a concept that has no specific up till now, specific content. The second is that it itself became embroiled in political discussions. And the concepts that were offered mainly focused on the third world, as it was called, with an attempt to show that Western democracy has an inbuilt superior advantage in this field. Other forms of regime are corrupt. And here what you can see is, and I don't want to uh, elaborate on that, the use of corruption as a political tool. In my definition, I would like to uh, go all the way back to a political thinker that confronted the problem in the 19th century, uh, actually, end of the 18th century, and that is Edmund Burke. His definition of corruption had to confront the situation that he was talking about India on the one hand and Britain on the other. Very different systems, to say the least. 
And therefore, to have a meaning, he needed to take the concept out, as it were, from the political reality that embeds them. My uh, definition following him is that we're talking about the use of office to subvert the boundaries separating social and economic power from political authority so as to advance partial benefits, be them individual, group, or even institutional. Let me just add one more thing. The connection need not be from the political to the economic. It could be the vice versa. And indeed, uh, we're talking about an ongoing relationship on both sides. And that would lead me to the definition of clientelism, which is the form of corruption that I would like to put an emphasis on today. And that is a clientelism as a political or social system that is based on the relationship of clients and patrons, with clients giving political vote or financial money, presence, whatever, um, support to the patron in exchange for privileges or any other forms of benefit, and those may include bribery in return. In other words, policy that creates a market for the briber or for the inver. It is generally considered a pathology of political uh, systems, and normally, the context of that definition was that it inhibits democracy. What I would like to focus on today is on a system that views such relationships as enhancing a form of democracy that we'll refer to, and that is the populism. And here, a minimum definition of populism. This is not mine. This is Klaus Mood, um, Cass Mood, I'm sorry, uh, a professor here in the United States, but as you can hear from uh, European origins. And his definition was of populism as a theory that has three legs, as it were. One, that society is divided between the pure people and the corrupt elite. This is a typically uh, claim of people who took over after a scandal. It need not be so. Uh, in Britain, Brexit, for instance. But normally it is. At all events, the basis of a claim is anti-corruption. It represents the pure people against the corrupt elite. Secondly, the argument that the will of the people is identifiable, it is singular. In other words, there is no massive continuum of opinions. It is a single kind of opinion and interests, and it is represented by the populist leader. The name doesn't matter. It is the leader or his government, a group of leaders, that would represent that kind of phenomenon. And thirdly, that the purpose of politics is to express and carry out the will of a people. Now, there were some theories of a linkage between uh, these three elements, and I'll mention only two of them. Both of them are really particular cases 
rather than a general pointing to the or point to the linkage between those. One of them is uh, on the background of uh, what happened in Italy with clean hands. Nine, early 90s, if you recall, that is a scandal that brought in its wake uh, Berlusconi and actually decimated the old political uh, system all at all. In uh, an article uh, on trust, cynicism, and populist anti-politics, uh, Katharina Fiesti and uh, Paul Hayward uh, argued that what we're dealing with is an encroachment of the business world into the political Berlusconi, into the political world, he became a prime minister, uh, in order to clarify the air, as it were, with the argument, I know I am corrupt, but I'll share with you, I'm a businessman, I'll share with you my uh, benefits as against the politicians who are corrupt and would keep the profits for themselves. So if you want, it's a kind of a cynical retort to scandal in which the pattern of behavior might continue, but the beneficiaries will change. It will be you and me. The alternative I'm going to uh, mention here is that of Nicholas Coswell, who argued in 2019 that populism is simply a rose. It is a cheat. It is a method by which business people take control of a system in order to perpetuate corruption. And we reach the point where they're able to, quote unquote, milk the system by using resentment against corruption, the argument of saving the people, or whatever you want in order to reach the positions that will allow them to do what they intended to do at the beginning. Can there be cases of this sort? Of course they can. And uh, I think that uh, what happened with Berlusconi, if I am correct, is an example of that. Uh, later on, I'll offer a few more examples which are more concrete and more up-to-date. Nonetheless, it can happen. It is normally what does not happen, in my opinion, at least. These two are not general theories, despite the fact that Coso, at least, tried to present it as a general hypothesis or general claim. Uh, these two are define definitions of extreme situations. What we rather have or need for is a mid-range kind of theory, general theory, but not of a kind that refers to populism or to corruption as a single entity and as a cover-up. Not all populism, populists are scoundrels. Not all of them come from the business world. Most of them, in fact, do not. Um, the situations that were referred to here are rather extreme and unusual. And furthermore, a lot of them offer a doctrine which they implicitly or explicitly even announce and is more than a cloak, hiding, if you want, clientelism. When we examine the claim that the people are one and that they have a vision, a interest, I think that we can pinpoint a reason why indeed there is so much corruption and especially clientelism in populist regimes.
Let me just point out that uh, from, I mentioned here the uh, journalistic brand of uh, looking at the thing. And whereas I don't want to delve with that, I think that it is common agreement that we did not see yet a populist regime that is not defined by endemic corruption of the kind that was much worse than the kind that it claimed to have uh, replaced. So you have a paradox, a group of people who come in uh, response to massive corruption, and so far, without exception, has proven to me far more corrupt than what they tried to replace. The only question is, what is corruption? And here I'd like to specify a bit about that in a minute. Let me go back to the theoretical reasoning behind it, as far as I could see. And that is that when you define corruption as a property of a group, especially when you're talking about a homogeneous group, when you define the people as a group, especially homogeneous group, then what you have is a justification of a regime that ignores the law. Let's go over it uh, in a bit more particular. These are regimes that are that serve themselves that originate in a protest phenomenon. It's an argument against elites. Now, who are the elites? Obviously, those elites that propped up from the older, that to be changed, political system. It is, in other words, a typical revolt against those who hold power in society. Businessmen, politicians, whatnot. Argument is that they furthered their interest by the use of, if you want, direct corruption or the siren song of corruption, the ability to cheat the population into supporting their activity in the name of safety. Note uh, how close it is to what uh, I presented here as the two, 2019 definition of the connection here. Uh, businessmen who try to uh, bamboozle the population in support of them. The only thing is that it is reversed. This is a populist claim against the current regime, the current order. As far as I know, there has been no populist up till now who defined his or theirs order as the corrupt. Of course not. Populists may come from Berlusconi, may come from a prevailing elite, but their commitment is to reverse the position, to turn the people into the masters and the old elite into something irrelevant. But who are the real people? How do you define them? Who are the corrupt elites? How do you define them? The uh, real people is not determined by such uh, regimes, by any other yardstick than their association with those in power, as against the powerful. In other words, the real people are those who support me, whoever they might be. Those who do not support me are either the corrupt elites or those who fell into their siren songs and one should 
free them. Now, we're talking into a kind of a Rousseauistic democracy in reverse. Whoever supports me is the real people. Whoever is in the opposition is the corrupt elite directly or vis-a-vis vis -vis, uh, the ruse, as it were, the cheat. Once you accept such a thing, these premises mean that the law as existed up to the moment here is irrelevant, and the people via their representatives are justified in ignoring or changing it in self-defense. The only thing is that the representative declares in the name of a people what should be the new mode, the new practice. The division between radical Rousseau-like democracy and outright authoritarianism a la Mussolini or, uh, is thereby blurred. It really becomes a question of who defines it. So the argument, I represent the people, whatever I do is correct, and I deserve the adherence of the people, irregardless of the law, is indeed what leads to the phenomenon that we're talking about. It can divide itself or it can end itself into uh, what happened in Italy, uh, in uh, uh, Hungary, illiberal democracy, if you so wish. It can turn into new relationships between the government and elites that have already, especially business elites, that have already an existence in society. Simply a new link. Let me try to sum up that part of what I'm saying here. Uh, Jean Muller called uh, the uh, phenomenon of uh, populism as a moralistic imagining of politics. That is, uh, we reverse the notion that elites are many and that they provide cues, clues, suggestions from which the citizenry chooses to construct actions and belief. We reverse that, and the consequence is that those who define what should be followed are those in office, and all opposition is suspicious or actions taken by them in retort to government is by definition corruption. Is it what we are talking about? At this junction, one can suggest several modes of such activity. The first is indeed that corrupt activity, either of businessmen, as the two theories that I mentioned here, or of people eager to establish business connections, connections to the world of wealthy. And uh, the typical thing is that it is done by secret, it is accepted by everybody that it is corruption. There is no attempt to defend. There is an attempt to hide. To use, if you want, as indeed uh, the argument was that Berlusconi has used, or that, uh, as Coso uh, claims, all populists use, uh, as a cheat, as a cover-up. I will call such a thing uh, opportunistic corruption. It is a corruption of people seeking the opportunity, whether they are already within the wealthy or whether they seek to become wealthy. They use the opportunity in order to further their interest. Uh, 
I would argue that such a thing is unrepresentative, mostly in regimes that we know, and uh, is more common to uh, petty crime, uh, such as that indeed you may find in various countries of the third world or the developing world, as we today prefer to call it. Um, it, it I simply remember a, tr um, a car moving uh, with me inside in La Paz and a captain of a police stopping in the middle of a road with his hand thrust out and everybody puts in the bribe. Otherwise, you'll be arrested. You are then uh, opportunistic corruption. But I think that we can agree that is not representative of what we find in most of the relatively developed country, at least. Uh, I would mention immediately that uh, Brazil, uh, United States, Britain, etc. fall within that category, so we can more or less dispense, dispense with this. A second time, a second formula of uh, such a phenomenon is compensatory corruption. Compensatory. That is, links to funding, links to money, links to business that uh, the population agrees should be the reward of a grateful citizens, the grateful members of the people to those who have saved them from the corruption of the exploiters. Let me just give you one or two illustrations of what we're talking about. Today, uh, the uh, person who is probably more in uh, the news than uh, anywhere else among the populists is Bibi Netanyahu, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Here is a populist who came to rescue the Israeli people from the corruption of the old elite and has been kicked out of office right now, mainly due to the fact that he is uh, on charges of corruption in three different cases. When I'll come back to the cases themselves, I'll particularize some of them. But um, the argument that was made at the night that the indictments were offered is illuminating. Let me offer the two, it's in January, the 20th of January, 2020, the two arguments. An argument number one, I'm, call, I'm reading here the argument offered by the chief of ceremony in a wide protest against the entire the entire uh, thing. And this is a lady that is claiming, and I'm quoting, the state of Israel against Netanyahu never has been mere, more abominable, ungrateful sentence. This is the person who saved us from corruption, doesn't he deserve our consideration? End quotation. Note the term. There is no uh, attempt even to argue that there was no case of corruption here. The argument is that uh, the person who helped himself deserves that helping. And that very night, uh, Bibi himself, Netanyahu himself, uh, offered his uh, national uh, retort to the uh, same accusation. I'm quoting from his argument. I have sacrificed my life for you, the people of Israel. I'll continue to sa sacrifice my life and all that I have. Leave me out with detail. Interesting. Leave me out with detail. 
what detail must he have in mind? But here I think that we can agree uh, this is a righteous argument of people who argue that they come to save the nation and nonsense should not bother them. They deserve some respect, and therefore, if they bypass the law that they're here to save the people from, um, this is only justice. A third kind of uh, corruption, if you want, is group-oriented corruption. We talk here about a world that is divided between us and them. And the aim here is to prevent the them from taking advantage of us. How can we do that? Well, obviously, by subverting the law. After all, the them are rich, the them are powerful, the them are elites, because they used a system of crooked law that allowed them to become on top. How do we do that? A few words of uh, the leader of uh, PIS, the Law and Order uh, Government uh, Party in Poland, may illustrate what we're talking about. I'm quoting, and excuse my Polish. He is arguing, uh, quote, in the bifurcated world, where the old elites have the advantage. The question is not how we play their game, but how we subvert it and turn it against them. This is not a situation where a person enjoys the fruit of power. This is a situation where all enjoy the fruit of power, end quotation. Note the argument here, again, we're not talking about individual corruption, we're talking about the subversion of laws so that we, the people, that is, all those who support me, especially myself, will have the advantage. Group-oriented corruption. A further point uh, or illustration of such relationships is what I will refer to as a defensive corruption. Defensive corruption, that is an attempt to be preemptive, to defend those who are pure and righteous in the future. And here what we find is the consequence of the blurred relationship between the leader or the leaders, the populists, and those led. Let me give you a, a story about Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump tried to squeeze arguments from Ukraine against his own, the family of Mr. Biden. Was he at right of doing it? Was he allowed to do it? Argument is, without doing that, the system itself would be weakened by a person called Biden and his corrupt children, those who enjoy the fruit of their power in order to squeeze benefit. And therefore, it's an act of future defense. Yeah. Uh, the actual future defense of the system. Let me 
move here because we're talking about the situation in Ukraine. Let me move here to what happened to Bibi Netanyahu. Now, what happened to Bibi Netanyahu was that on the one hand, he was accused of receiving a gift to the tone at the time of $250,000 from businessmen. Now, theoretically, these are gifts, only such gifts are raised immediately in our guy, an eyebrow. Um, people in office receiving quarter of a, a million dollars in gifts are raised suspicions. But there was a different attitude or a different case. And that is the attempt of Netanyahu to bribe media elites. Now, this is directly for cash. And the deal was that they will represent the Netanyahu government in good light in return for cash or for benefits that involve the gaining of market, i.e. cash. Now, let me emphasize, um, this is what is today in court. The uh, argument was not yet made on behalf of Netanyahu. What we're hearing is the prosecution. And therefore, uh, this is at least an argument concerning it. And I'm referring you to what he, what Netanyahu argued at the beginning. To what extent did it become a group oriented um, or a deserved dessert argument? We shall see. Finally, I would like to point out uh, one more uh, form, the last form of corruption that one could uh, note, and that is what I called illegal corruption. Uh, let me just uh, mention here that the term has been hijacked by me. It's a, it's a, it's a form of theft in itself. Uh, we're referring here to a concept that some time ago defined the situation where elites sell uh, to businessmen mainly uh, laws that will make their activity legal. This is obviously the case. The illustration, the, best, the most notorious illustration comes from Africa. Uh, this is a situation which uh, does not occur in our world, but what does occur is the flouting of norms and standards in broad daylight by populists seeking to advertise their anti-establishment positions. This is a form, if you want, of a low culture that we uh, that uh, people like, and I mentioned here, Ostigai, Roberts, and others in political science define as the defining uh, style of populist. When we're talking about uh, a person like Trump, we're talking simply about unusual amount of cases that normally will be considered corruption that uh, were done in public with disregards to the law, with various elements enjoying it, some industrialists, corporations, by the way, uh, a, a lot of corporations, that is the problem that the United States is confronting right now. So it's not simply the business world, it's the corporate business world, um, but also uh, individual. So most notorious is his opening of uh, a university that offered nothing whatsoever in return for cash. Um, and that was settled in itself, although um, Donald Trump would have argued that it is his just deserts.
So altogether, uh, let me try to wrap up what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is that populism is a kind of regime that substitutes or that tends to substitute the law as exists by clientelism. The argument is that whoever supports the regime cannot act corruptly because by definition of those who stand against it are the corrupt. But this does not involve necessarily only opportunistic corruption. That is corruption by businessmen or by similar entities who try to uh, squeeze whatever benefit they can by seizing office. Whether or not Berlusconi uh, is, is a sample of that is a problematic question in my mind. I think here that one can imagine such situations, they're unusual and far in between. What is more probable is the situation of compensatory corruption, the gifts. Here I am, I'm helping the people. If businessmen give me a few gifts, that is only natural. I saved the entire nation. Why not? Uh, group oriented. So if businessmen want to contribute to the real, uh, authentic people, they deserve our consideration and we deserve their, what they offer us. So we're not taking it in order to enrich ourselves. We're taking it in order to help the system purify itself. And therefore, all those who contribute to it deserve our recognition. Call it clientelism or any other one. Defensive uh, corruption. That is the preemptive attempt whether by business or by media or by others, to prevent the corrupt from taking office. The fact that such defensive action is referred to as corruption is in itself the product of corruption, according to this argument. And then legal, or oh, I'm sorry, defensive corruption and legal corruption. That is, all holds bar, as you call it, everything is permitted. Let's do what we damn well please. Those who give me money or those who try to create clientelistic relations with me, bless they be. In other case, I'll initiate. Let's do whatever we want. And this may explain the unusual in the United States, unheard of levels of corruption that uh, were reached by a Trump administration. Here I'd like to stop. And if there are any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jonathan Mendel, for your uh, lecture. Uh, it was very clear. Uh, thank you for your insights on the relationship between populism, corruption, and clientelism. And now we have time for questions. And uh, Marina Sartori uh, wrote a question in the chat. Can you read it? Or... Yeah. The, the, okay. So here is an, a question that has to do not only with today. I think that everybody can read the question or... No, no, please. Uh, no, no. Allow me to read the question for you okay. because I think it's very... It, it exactly touches on what we're talking about. Uh, Marina says, Your speech made me think about the global dispute over vaccine supply that frames people with a homogeneous claim, be vaccinated. It also frames businessmen 
vaccine producers as people with humanitarian as well as commercial interests and governments as politicians who have to deal with people claim and pharmaceutical claims. Do you think that the scandals and conflicts each country has been facing related to vaccine supply could be a good data source to test and illustrate the framework and types of corruption, especially in the United States, that changed government in the middle of the pandemic? And here is... um, a question that is both profound and difficult to answer. So the argument that is now heard in the United States is that the United States uh, is, has bought uh, 500 million vaccines and is sending it to the world in order to uh, help in an effort that will uh, help the United States as well. In other words, none of us will be safe until the world will be safe. We're talking about links to abroad, but we're also talking about the ability of the uh, famous coronavirus to change and to inflict us new forms that may even overcome the vaccine. So we're talking today about the Indian form and about the British form and about the South African form and that kind of thing. To what degree is it involved in the clientelistic relationship that we're talking about? And here my answer is that it will be very, very difficult. A, Most of the clientelistic relationship that we talked about are direct. In other words, it is something that occurs within the country for the country. It is new ties to business elites or the forging of new business elites to benefit those forces that support the regime. This is not what is happening here, unless you want to do something else, and that is to look at the transaction here as purely intended to enrich those who engage in the production in return for favors. I think that will be very difficult to, to, to prove. Not only because we're not talking about domestic, but rather because we're talking about, uh, to a large extent, a relationship with the foreign world. The question could be laid in a different format. Giving vaccines to the world today, will it create a scenario in which countries, receiving countries, will owe something to the donating regime? That is a question that uh, should obviously be offered not only to the United States, but to China and to Russia, the two parties that up till now uh, helped quite a few uh, needy countries in this regard. My answer uh, to the question, is this a new form of populism on a global scale, is that uh, we can employ such terms, but what the cost will be is that we're blurring the question of relationships and by moving them from the domestic to the international or global field. And therefore, I would suggest that we won't do it, although the parallel is obvious to see. Okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, Marina, are you okay? Yes, thank you so much. It was very insightful. Um, And yes, I think we could explore this in the global, in the national level and also in the individual level. Because I, I, I've heard that in the United States, uh, people could, was, uh, was able to buy vaccine, uh, to pay to be vaccinated. And here in Brazil, we are not still allowed to do that. So, I, and, and because of that, 
uh, there were uh, some kinds of corruptions, some scandals of people who bought um, uh, or, or paid to be vaccinated. So I think it, it could be, uh, uh, it's a global phenomena. So we can understand the differences between countries uh, in the international level, in the national level, but also in the individual level, right? Yep, yep. Well, let me just uh, refer to one point that you've made, Marina. Um, in the United States, the unleasing of the vaccine was uh, not on a individual level, but on a collective. So in order to get vaccinated, you needed to prove that you're eligible. And then it costs you nothing. It is really the uh, payment of your uh, health benefits. This does not answer the question concerning individual cases, and they were individual cases in which people were able to come up and purchase. Uh, it is only to say that it was illegal up to now. Was it a question of patronage? I don't think so. Certainly, if there is any patronage, it is a patronage of government and the insurance companies, but those are plurality of insurance companies. So let me just give you an illustration of what we're talking about. Um, I uh, arrived just about two months ago from Australia. And in Australia, the one who will be, and there intending to roll it up are uh, the uh, the ones who will be unrolling the vaccination uh, project is the national health insurance company uh, in the united states when i came and got vaccinated here my insurance is aetna but it's a, a one company out of oh i couldn't name you how many 50 uh, all of which engage in the same kind of thing. To what extent are we talking about a populist kind of effort to create clientelism? I doubt it. I don't doubt the fact that there could be cases of corruption. That is, people who will simply come up to uh, whoever delivers and uh, offers a bundle of cash. But these are not corruption of a kind of format that we're talking about. We're talking here about massive corruption that is led from above. This is corruption of the old sort. Uh, somebody who has extra money trying to squeeze a benefit that they don't deserve. So, up to here. Perfect. Uh, right. Thank you so much. You're most welcome, Marina. Thank you for your question. More questions from the audience? Uh, I, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the, the first, I would like to know if you could uh, uh, talk a little bit more between the uh, about the relationship between business people and the populist leaders. And, uh, and the second question is, uh, you are going to publish next Friday uh, a book uh, named Populism and Corruption, The Other Side of the Coin. And uh, I would like to know if you could uh, say a little bit more about the, the main conclusions of this book in a comparative perspective. Uh, I hope that many people from many countries uh, uh, wrote chapters, and if you can make some, uh, yeah, summarize even that. people from Brazil. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you have noticed, I was very, very careful to avoid mentioning Brazil. Uh, uh, there is a chapter here, and uh, there's more than one chapter actually um, uh, on. Brazil, but uh, yours, by the way, uh, deals with that. But let me let me answer your first question first. 
When I discussed here the relationship between uh, populism and corruption, I emphasize the role of people who are the clients. Now, the reason for that is pretty obvious once you think about it. Populist regime norm, no regimes normally arise from a setting where it was not a populist regime prior to them. It could have been a corrupt regime. It's not a populist regime. These are revolts, if you want. Protest movements taking over. Those who made money under such regimes will become obvious when time comes. But when we're talking about the present, it is those who made money under previous conditions. The question is, however, how do we create the link between them if we are to create? Now, I've mentioned here several modes of reasons for the creation of such things. And uh, one noticed, I hope, that I'm talking really about the continuum from individual link. In other words, uh, those who have made money, businessmen and so forth, I want to enjoy their largesse and I'm using actually a form of bribery. I will give them what they want. They will give me what I want. If you want, if you recall my definition of corruption, this is simply typical corruption. You turn existing economic power into political benefits or vice versa. And you subvert the relationship or the thin red lines, differentiating the two. Now you could make it and you could put it differently. In a way, this is an invitation from those in office to businessmen to become in indirect way part of the regime itself, to fund it. So the aim here is to cause a switch of alliance. Note that the argument is, or could be, when you're talking about a defensive, and I'm jumping to the last element before the end, uh, the last category, uh, that uh, you've simply purified yourself from being a supporter of the, uh, the corrupt elites. Now you purified yourself and you're becoming the great defender of the pure people. So you have, by simply giving a few resources, that's all, uh, you have one moral purity. That's exactly what I referred to when I quoted here uh, Muller with his political imagining. It's an uh, imagining of the process of purification by switching allegiance. Put it differently, by behaving corruptly in terms of the laws as still exist. So on the whole, if I'm to sum up this perspective, what I try to point out is that there is a continuum of behaviors. All of them are really concerned with those who have resources in society. As yet, before the establishment of populist regimes, these are people who represent the old order, not the new one. And consequently, the attempt is to convert them into the new position. And here, with some hesitant, I'll ask uh, Paolo, to what extent do you see that in Brazil? In other words, not an effort to create new wealth uh, elements, but an effort to use ongoing existing networks to convert the industrialists, the businessmen, and so forth to support the regime. So we're talking really about a switch in the direction of corruption. As a foreigner, I would say, despite the fact that the regime will say this is not corruption at all, this is uh, their repentance. And, uh, well, maybe. Um, am I correct, Paolo? 
just uh uh oh sure yeah. follow yeah it's okay okay but uh okay i, I know if we, we have uh, uh, other questions but i uh, i appreciate your comments and of course, I will use it in my studies, and my my question is related to this kind of uh, the agenda of the studies of on the relationship between businessmen, corruption, and populism. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So let me answer uh, Wagner's uh, uh, the question Wagner's question concerning the book that is about to be published um, next week. What I try to do is to uh, look at the other side of the coin. Now, a lot of the studies, most of the studies, let me try to correct that. Uh, all the studies that I have seen about the link between corruption and uh, populism looked at the pop the argument of the students of populism that populism rests on a definition of elites as corrupt. This is one of the core elements of the definition. You don't need to define the situation. You don't need to delve into it. What is important is the claim here. When I look at the arguments or the uh, efforts to probe the question from the point of view of those who study corruption, I find a big vacuum. I mentioned here two names, and uh, I uh, would hesitate to say, but I think it's true that those are the only two examples that I know of, at least. And at least until the last year, I went over each and every uh, element that, or uh, publication that I could in order to locate such efforts. I simply didn't find them. Those two, as I tried to show, are unpersuasive, at least. Uh, I find them intelligent as they are, interesting as they are, defining situations which are marginal situations. Can they exist? Yes. Do they define what happens today in the world that we refer to as populist world, including United States up until half a year ago, uh, most of the countries of Eastern Europe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think no. So I uh, would have wanted to see a deeper understanding of the phenomenon from the point of view of people who are interested in corruption as a form of study. We uh, the book itself contains. Three, three components, one of them, three chapters arranged in three parts. One of them is the theoretical part. That is actually what you've heard, uh, a lot of what you've heard. So what you've heard is uh, some of what I presented in my chapter. Others is an attempt to study populism as a form of political theory and to identify what it is that explains the plethora of corruption, as I said, in all known up to now, regimes that called themselves or were called by others populists. And that, again, um, of course, uh, bearing in mind that uh, I'm talking about the sensitive question uh, when we talk about Brazil, but it is true, I think, when you look at Haider in, uh, in uh, Hungary or Putin in Russia or uh, Trump in the United States or Netanyahu in Israel. And uh, I think, if I may, that Brazil will not prove to be such an enormous exception. Uh, what we do then in the second part of the book is go into specific case studies. 
What is the linkage between actual corruption and populism in various countries? And here we made a choice of countries that belong to a wide spectrum. Uh, we wanted to include here not only countries from various parts of the world, but various typical situations. So in my case, uh, we have on West Eastern Europe, we have on France, we have on uh, United States, we have on Israel, etc., etc., etc. We have Africa. Uh, we try to cast a wide range. And then we have a third uh, part in which Wagner himself participates, um, and that is uh, an attempt to ask ourselves, how do we establish such a thing? So there's one thing which is a theoretical claim. There's another thing which is a case study. But there is a question, how do you establish such links in general. Do you go through the world of finance? This is one. Do we go to the network of links? Do we go to what do we go in order to give ourselves the answer to the question, if we're not looking at the argument here as a kind of accusation, but we're really interested in probing a phenomenon? How do we manage to prove it exists and its dimensions? So this is the book. I had two uh, questions uh, um, that came from your interesting lecture. The first one, you have just talked about oh, uh, what kind of, uh, what would, would be the, the role of companies in entrepreneurs in sustaining and enhancing the political forms of and behaviors that combine in populism and corruption in, in, in their places of origin they, they belong and in other countries. And the impact of this on the functioning of and consolidation of democracy, mainly, mainly in some countries like Brazil. I, I think you have uh, answered this uh, Uh, but I have another question uh, more related to our uh, uh, agenda, our uh, research agenda. What kind of, combina what type or combination of types of corruption you have mentioned it would be more suggestive for a research agenda on business, companies, and businessmen? in their relation with both populism and corrupt practice. Well, thank you. This itself uh, is a question that I need to deal with uh, a lot. But let me, let me offer a, a one or two questions that I personally am interested in and always remembering that if I go to ask any politician or businessman, excuse me, are you corrupt? Uh, the answer is likely to be no. And that will be a kind answer. So uh, the problem that uh, confronts us here is that uh, we engage in uh, a sphere which is, by the nature of things, hidden. Uh, what Wagner offers here, uh, and what his fellow writers offered here, is simply a study of linkages. Are there any linkages, say, between the new government or the populist uh, leadership in Brazil and the old commercial establishment, companies, individuals? If so, what is the degree of closeness that you find here? Again, remember, if I go to each one of them and I'll ask the direct question, I'm going to hit a negative. No less important here is the question of indirect. Here we're, we're talking about uh, really forms that uh, in, you could, in other circumstances, call them perhaps bribery. 
Uh, but we're really talking here also about the political finance connection. To what degree do old elites contribute directly to those interested in their, theoretically, in their decimation? Now, let me give you an illustration taken from the United States. The uh, current uh, regime, notwithstanding, and we'll have to see, it's not a populist regime, and therefore we can't talk about him. We are more at liberty to talk about the relationship between the Trump administration, problematic as it was, and the elites in the United States. Is it a coincidence that there were massive contributions from the business world to a person who came all in fire and storm against them? Or does it explain the reason for the last tax reform, which lowered their taxes from 28 to uh, 15%? I, of course, if you ask a question like that, if you ask each businessman, excuse me, did you contribute to Trump because uh, he lowered your taxes? You're going to you're going to have a negative answer. If the if you believe that this is a sheer coincidence, he simply didn't know what he was doing, and neither do them. Um, I think that uh, you're, you're terribly naive. The question, of course, is how do we prove? And I think that uh, simply the argument that two plus two makes four is the proof. The um, question that I have is something else, and that is how do you prevent turning such uh, an attempt to quarry, if you want, into uh, what goes on here? How do you prevent it from becoming really a form of journalism? This is the first question. The second question, if you're dealing with proof of the pudding, you'll have to go down, if you want, from the theoretical level in which I uh, presented it into concrete examples. Uh, that, uh, again, will sink you into journalism and would put also uh, a threat above your head. And that is that you're claiming here something that uh, a court will have to claim. And then the question will be, according to what law, who nominated the judges? And uh, in other words, you're risking your own uh, position here. I don't have answers. I will certainly think about them. And I hope this will uh, be reflected in an additional book, or I will simply uh, decide that uh, there is no answer except the historical one. That could be the answer. So you're dealing really with a part of history. And then you don't have to fear so much, and in all likelihood, you can begin to uh, offer concrete questions. So when I talked here about uh, Netanyahu, uh, his trial is ongoing. We don't know, except that uh, people who were already convicted by the courts in Israel are his partners. Uh, can there be one-sided corruption? We gave bribery, but nobody received them. Um, I don't know. I don't want to. I, I don't want to delve into that. But I am sure that in a few years' time we'll be at ease in offering whatever we can. So the difference will be here between a historical and a concrete, and it is the concrete world, the world of concreteness, that poses the two threats that I've just mentioned here, and it will be. I hope my own as well as Wagner's and Paolo's and everybody else job to figure out how do we overcome this? What do we do with this? <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Thank So, uh, more questions? 
So I, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jonathan Mendel for uh, his talk, for his lecture, and we hope we can meet uh, soon, maybe in the next RC20 meeting, or maybe at uh, uh, International Political Science Association meeting. So uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, thank you. Jonathan, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let me just uh, end up with a uh, 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 hello to somebody else who I'm meeting here, and that is uh, it is Angela. Um, if I'm not mistaken, she too contributed to the book, and I would like to thank her. And uh, so it has been a pleasure to talk to you all, and I hope indeed to see all of you who have an interest in one of our future uh, meetings somewhere in the world. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.